as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men, say ten men, who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were what? That's right. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him what? That's right. And he was a what? So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the what? All right. Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. I want to tag this text today after we left. After we left. As many of not most of us have visited at least one physician in life, right? For something, even if it was for, a, a, you know, a, a minor checkup. Um, maybe you were not ill, but you visited a, a physician. Maybe you were ill, but you visited a nurse, a doctor, uh, military. We call it uh, what sick call, nurse advice line. <laughs> as you waited forever to get through to somebody, right? <laughs> we know about that, don't we? But we, we've all paid them a visit, right? <laughs> but how do you know that God still heals? He still heals. Yes, he does. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. But he may not always do it as quick as we expect him to do, but he does. Uh, even some people who leave here, uh, guess what? That's the healing. I remember my mother said, um, we'll celebrate, I guess, her home going. She died in January 2017. And she said, God's going to heal me. He told me he's going to heal me this year. And we're like, okay, man, praise the Lord. But we didn't realize the way he was going to heal her. He's going to take her out of the pain she was in. No more sickness. No more pain. She has a, a, a brand new body. Amen glorified body thank the lord and yeah we were sad but we were rejoicing that she didn't have to suffer in any more pain hallelujah amen um uh, but god still does heal but i'm 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 gonna truthfully mess with some of our our theological thinking if i can for a few minutes is that all right uh how do you know that god is not an always on time god He's not always he's not always on time. I know we love that song by Dottie Peoples. She sang oh, what oh, some twenty some odd years ago. He's an on time God. Yes he is. Oh, oh on time God. Yes he is. Y'all know it. He may not come when you want him. What? He'll be there right on time. He's an on time God. Yes, he is. But that ain't scriptural. The Bible says that we need to sing with the understanding too, don't it? Yeah. He ain't always on time, y'all. Because, I mean, didn't she just say? He may not come when you want him to come. She's contradicting herself at the same time. He's an on-time God, but he may not come when you want him to come. Why well, then he ain't on-time God? You got it? It's his time. It's his time. But the song sounds good. But we contradict ourselves. I mean, the whole church, that's the anthem of the body of Christ. The gospel churches throughout the world. He's an on time God. Got that beat. Come on out. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that sounds good. Yes, he is. He may not come when you want to wait a minute. Hold up. You just said he's an on time God. Either he is or he ain't. Talk to me somebody. He's not always on time. But it doesn't mean he's not going to do it for you. 
Amen. He may do it a whole different way or different time or different season. But guess what? He does it. You won't talk to me. Yeah, he'll get it done when he chooses to. Amen. Oh, I know I'm messing with somebody don't like me right now. Amen. He's a later this hour. Later this afternoon, come on now, later this evening, later this year, later this decade, later on in life kind of God. Because there's some things God told me he was going to do uh, when I was 20 years old. God didn't do for me till I was 36. I had to wait on the season to happen. I had to grow and develop. Just like the Bible says about Jesus, how uh, 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 that the child grew. Right. He grew into the things of God and also in life. Things happen at a certain time, at a certain season in life for all of us. But it doesn't mean that the Lord is not going to do it for you. Amen. Oh, God. Uh, we often in our minds place God where we want him to move on our behalf. How many of you know that God doesn't always move according to our timetable? Mm -mm. Not. Mm -mm. Cause you know, I, I you know, I like Galatians 6 9. You know, don't be weary in what? Well doing. For in due season, we shall reap. If we faint not, faint means to become discouraged, to get weak, to throw in the towel, to give up. But for me, due season is right now. <laughs> see, I don't see, see y'all too serious for me. I'm trying to make you laugh there, but the direction sometimes later comes in life. The understanding comes a little later. It may not come when you not want it to come, but guess what? It comes. Researchers in, in facets of medicine and academia seek to find answer to plaguing problems that mankind had. You know, how to find some cures to illnesses. Guess what? It doesn't come right then. It's after years of research, testing and trying and trials on humans and animals experiments here and there because we want to take care of mankind right doesn't happen right then and there amen scientific cures evolve over years and years of time but you know you, you ever heard somebody say uh you'll get it next week it, it'll come to you next week you ever hear preachers like me will say you know oh you, you'll get that by tuesday <laughs> <laughs> right? You'll get it by Thursday, Friday, but you'll get it. Yeah. Yeah. The idea, the thought, the plan, the goal, the purpose, the thing that's been plaguing you, you it's now completed product, the full essence of what you are to do. But guess what? It comes later on. Some wish it would have come earlier on. Now, if I were to take you back to Second Kings chapter five, verses one through 19, I'm not. But the, the you know, the Syrian general, the commander, you know him, Naaman. You remember Naaman? Oh, that's one of my favorite stories. I love that. I love that. How this man, he was plagued with leprosy. We're going to talk about this today. And uh, he's, he assumed around uh, the 11th verse that the prophet Elijah would just, Elisha, excuse me, would come down and lay his hand on him, touch him, and he'd get healed from what he was dealing with. Right? That's what we do. We assume God's going to do a certain thing or move a certain kind of way, do a certain kind of thing, move a certain kind of time, a season. He'll just do what he just normally does. But again, how many of you know that God chooses to move how he chooses to move? Amen. Yeah, I, I'll just get my healing. But he didn't like the direction the prophet Elijah gave him. You need to go and dip in the nasty, sewage-infested Jordan River. You can't cross it. It's muddy. It's murky. It's sewage. I ain't going over there. Why can't I go over to, to Parfur and all these other rivers? They're beautiful rivers. Why can't I go over there and dip and get my healing? Because that ain't what God said. So that's how the Lord will deal with us this year. He'll, he'll, he'll deal with us in certain ways. And he'll say, I want you to go over here and do this. I want you to treat her better. I want you to treat him better. Why can't I do that, God? Why can't I just send a text and say, I'm sorry? Because they'll misunderstand what you're saying. You need to go and sit and talk to him, talk to her, write a letter, do whatever you got to do. Straighten the situation out. Are you with me? Oh, God. Look at somebody and say, after we left. 
Mm hmm. But once he dipped in that river, he got what? He got his healing. That's right. He got cleansed. Amen. Such is the, the discourse of our text of Luke chapter 17. We find a very well known story of how many men? Ten. Ten men, lepers, who by law is being contagious and unclean persons. Lepers, they were supposed to isolate themselves from others, demonstrate their impurity and warn people of their illness. That's what they had to do. They had to wear torn clothes, let their uh, hair be unkempt rather, or cover the lower part of their faces and shout unclean. Really, they had to shave their heads. Just imagine these men had families, beloved. Perhaps some of them made a, a, a good wage, a good living, and had uh, uh, spouses and children and notoriety in life in houses and lands. And just imagine these were, uh, some of these could have been men of prominence, providence. But guess what? They were lepers. Look at them, I say, they were lepers. This narrative of Luke, uh, the, the whole book of Luke is the longest of the four quartet gospels. Uh, you know, he was a, a pharmacist. Uh, that's what he was. But but he stresses several things. Uh, Jerusalem is the goal of Jesus journey. That's where he wanted to end up. And uh, he's he has mercy, beloved, on social outcasts. Social outcasts. I know every day you drive, you see social outcasts. Some of you see some of these people. You know where I'm going, Sister Ruby. You see some of these people that they're, they're, they're panhandling. Jesus had mercy on people like what you and I drive by. We act like we don't see. Oh, y'all don't get convicted because I've done it too. I'm like, Lord, not today. I ain't got no change. Right? <laughs> Yeah, but, 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 but he has mercy in the, on these men. He conforms to Jewish norms by requiring that the lepers go to see the priest to declare them healthy in Leviticus chapter 14. Leviticus 14. Faith and healing should bring praise to God. And lastly, God's grace extends beyond Judaism with, with the Samaritans who felt isolated due to their race. Amen. Special attention. Rather, God gives grace to everybody. Say amen. But when we look at these verses, 11 through 13, Luke does not mention where the particular place where the healing took place. Not at all. But he implies it was on Jesus' way to Jerusalem. Right? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Somewhere between Samaria and Galilee. Leprosy, beloved, was a generic general term uh, given to describe a variety of skin disorders. They didn't know what to call it. So some of them could have had several different things going on, but they just classified them in one general category like we do. Like we may say uh, uh, he has a cold. She has a cold, but it could be a different kind of sickness. Right. That's what they did. They said, so what we're going to do is quarantine you all and, and you got to stand outside of the city. You got to put a sign on yourself saying that you were unclean. You're unclean. You can't even be near folks because what you have is most likely contagious. And the disease ate at these men so bad you could see their bones which were exposed. Ain't that something? Uh, have you, you ever been ashy? Come on. Come on. Some of y'all say you put lotion on every day. Right? <laughs> Just think about that. Times a hundred. They had boils, you name it. And, and, and it, it was just not a grotesque kind of thing. It was not a good thing to see. It was very gro grotesque to see. And people felt like if they got within a few feet of these men, they would catch whatever they got. Nurse, you kind of identify where I'm going with this? Yeah, that's, that's how they, they thought in that day, biblically. That's all they knew. And so they said, we want to confine everybody and quarantine them in a certain uh, a, a, a leprocerularium kind of place known as a hospice. That's what we want to call it. But we had to put them outside of the city. And they were left there to die. 
because their bodies deteriorated down to raw flesh to scaly spots on the skin. So we had to craft some sort of legislature. That's what they had to do to handle and contain the disease. Levitical protocol was that those who suffered with, with this disease had to again be taken away from regular society and put away in leprosaliums. Leprosaliums. Leprosaliums, meaning they had to be put in what now we call again hospice care. They had to fend for themselves. They had a general, uh, somewhat kind of disease in common. We're going to go a little deep on that spiritually in just a moment. Preachers, you already know where I'm going. And uh, they were the Bible's version, again, of hospice. They were left there to suffer and eventually die. They had to shave their heads bald and again and wear a sign that said unclean, say unclean. And when anybody got near them, they had to say, don't come near me. I'm unclean. Unclean, unclean. Just think about the humiliation they felt, the isolation they felt, you know, just to tell people and the sadness that they felt and the desperation that they felt to tell people I'm unclean. I probably lost my wife, lost my children, lost my job, lost everything and I'm unclean and I'm dying. Isn't that something? These men, they suffered this, they went through this, and it was very painful for them. Mm Mm-hmm. If anybody got within their presence, they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't deal with that. Uh, They could be uh, uh, even beheaded if they didn't come out and tell people and warn people, don't get near me. Mm Mm-hmm. Legality, as I shared with you, was the protocol was put on this disease. But again, theology was those who suffer from leprosy were viewed, oh God, as those who suffered. (laughs) Because the crazy Judaizers of that day, from the very stroke of the hand of God, are living from the wrath of God. Here it is again. We got 10 men, say 10 men, 10 men. Taken from their families, taken from their jobs, taken away from their spouses and children who suffered from leprosy. When we read this text, it says to us, Jesus visited the vicinity of the contaminated. Let me say that again. It says to us, Jesus visited the vicinity of the contaminated. Grace doesn't only come to you and I, it comes to your contaminated place in your contaminated condition. When other folks don't want to be bothered with you and give you grace, grace comes and heals you. Grace comes and delivers you. Grace comes and brings you out. Grace comes and gives you a better idea. Grace comes and helps you leave a better way, having a better understanding, learning how to treat people better. Grace comes and shows you how to forgive when you don't want to forgive. Shows you how to keep your mouth shut and not get in other folks' business. Grace comes and gives you and I wisdom on how we ought to treat our family members. I don't know where that came from. That's for somebody online. I don't know who that's for. But but grace comes and he helps us to be better. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Look at my say, God, thank you for your grace. That's what grace does. It's when God shows us and, and, and uh, he, I, he, he wants to be close to you while you're suffering with something that gives him a reason to stay distant. Got to say that again. Grace is when God uh, wants to be close to you while you're suffering with something that gives him reason to stay away from you and I. You and I are struggling with things that ought to keep God distant from us. Mm -hmm. Yet he chooses to get close to people who are struggling with something that ought to keep God away. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, again, visits our vicinity, beloved, I'm moving hurriedly, of the contaminated to extend grace to those he ought to stay away from. It's the Son of God coming to keep company with people who are living with the wrath of God according to them. 
Yeah, you, you get this. According to them, according to them in that day, the Bible says something interesting to us, beloved. I want to make this interesting for you. Jesus shows up at this hospice station that is keeping people to contain that virus, you could say, of leprosy. The Bible says he doesn't introduce himself. No, he doesn't. They already know who he is. Are you following that? Text says, and they saw him afar off. Verse 13, they say, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Bible says they saw him. Look at my say, they saw him, they saw him. Spoke to him, knew who he was, and made a good request from him. How I many of you know you have to get tired of being tired? You have to be tired. You have to get to a point you're tired of going through mess. Can't nobody get there but you. You know, I, 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 I need to start the new year off right. Are you tired of going through what you've been going through? Are you tired of, of dealing with the same old stuff you've been dealing with for years? Talk to me, somebody. Uh, are you desperate enough to make some alterations and some changes in your life? Do you want the Lord to, to, to touch a situation? Are you tired? Are you ready to really come out of that thing? Are you with me right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. God will always give you and I the opportunity to come out of that state we're in. A good example for this is sometimes we have to get away from some people who influence us to make premature or immature decisions. The later go on to hinder us from getting what God has for us. Oh, it's real quiet. Some folks, you don't need to keep listening to y'all. You need to hear the Lord for yourself. The Bible says to him who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Jesus said, for my sheep, they will know my voice, and a stranger they will not what? Follow. Amen. Say amen if you can. Some of us stay on Facebook all the time, but we need to get our face into the book and hear what God has to say to us. Say amen if you can. Facebook sees us more than Jesus does. Say amen if you can. If all you do is post all day and all night, you ain't hearing God. Some folks feel like, uh, you know what, if social media went away, there would be no more Facebook pastors, no more Instagram pastors, no more of that. A lot of them folk ain't got no call, no anointing, no appointing, no nothing. Y'all know this. Y'all know you hear some of these folk get up there, they don't even know what they're talking about. They don't even have the basics of salvation correct. But folk following them. Talk to me. I'm with, I'm with you on that. Some of these folks, I'm like, I'm unfollowing. Oh, Lord. Some people don't even know who the Holy Spirit is. Don't even know who Jesus is. Want to preach to somebody. You ain't never even sat underneath a pastor for at least three years to learn something. But you want to get out and do your own thing. You quack. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. Some folk you need to get away from who convince you to keep doing stuff. Uh, and then you wonder why you're so frustrated. Oh, this ain't happening for me. This ain't happening. You need to stop listening to him. You need to stop listening to her and learn to hear God for yourself. You can't get what God has for you listening to everybody. Oh, God. Some friends you and I will have to separate from. Stop listening to them. They're not helping you get what God has for you. That's why you're so frustrated. The Lord is visiting you today, and he's giving you the opportunity. You need to cry out and say, Lord Jesus, help me. I want to get out of this situation. I'm tired. I want something new to happen in my life. Here's the question. Have you cried loud enough to the Lord? Have you and I cried loud enough? Do you really want to get his attention? Once you do this, guess what? Jesus is going to look at you. Bible says those 10 lepers, they shared a common misery, common misery, common misery. 
Some of us share common miseries with people in our families. People on the jobs. We have common situations we've all gone through, y'all. Losses of loved ones, loss of spouses, all kinds of things, financial things you've gone through. We all have some common miseries, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's no thing that has happened to you as such as common to man, but God makes a way for us, what? To escape so that we, we have the strength to be able to go through it, to bear it. Say amen if you can. Amen. Oh, God, I'm dealing with this. Is there an end in sight? I don't feel like I have no hope, no light at the end of the tunnel. tunnel. And some folks say, yeah, child, I'm dealing with the same thing. We just accept things for what they are. But when you hear that you have an opportunity for your life to change, you got to do with everything you have. You have to be willing to uh, get out of your situation. The 10 lepers called Jesus by a term only found in the book of Luke. That word master, say master. master. Jesus was in the area. Guess what they did? They got his attention. Guess what? They asked for pity. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Yeah. They didn't specify their request. No, they didn't. Verse 14 says, Jesus saw them. I'm hurrying on. How many of you know that the Lord doesn't always work the way you and I expect him to work? This year, I truly believe, beloved, uh, those who are watching online, that supernatural blessings and breakthroughs are going to happen for you and your family. I believe that. If you believe that, give God praise on that. Come on, some of y'all been waiting on God to do some things for you. Come out of some situations you've been in for a long, long time. Because guess what? You got Jesus' attention. And now guess what? He's looking at you. He's looking at you. The Lord doesn't always heal us according to the way we think he's going to heal us. Sometimes he requires you and I to do something. He requires us to do this one point. I'm only giving you one point today. And that is he requires us to obey him. To obey him. Here it is. He says, go show yourselves to the priests. Remember, according to Leviticus 14, the lepers had to go for their regular priestly declaration of health. Bible says in verse 14 that as they were on their way to see the priest, this is where we derived our text from after we left. They were what? Cleansed. Fully cleansed. Fully delivered. Fully restored. Skin restored. No more bones uh, exposed. Talk to me, somebody. Think about that, y'all. Once you come out of your situation, folk ain't looking at you crazy no more. Your secrets ain't exposed no more. Folks ain't seeing the innermost of you. Oh, I wish somebody caught that revelation right there. And folks ain't looking at you, you know, isolating you anymore. Because guess what? You are now fully restored. Hallelujah. They were on their way to obey the Lord's command. But I'm reminded when Jesus said, we're to love our neighbor as well as ourselves. And let me give you some application. Don't be surprised when the Lord moves on your heart and spirit again to give that person. Uh, you know you wrong to call and make that situation right. Don't be surprised when the Lord speaks to you, you, to you to go to your spouse and work that situation out. Talk to me, somebody. Don't be surprised when the Lord speaks to you to go speak to your mom or your dad or your grandparent and work that misunderstanding out. To even go to your child and work that situation out. Because guess what, parents? We ain't always right, y'all. There's some time I had to go to my son, had to go to my daughter and say, you know what? Dad loves you. I made a mistake. I was, I'm sorry. I was thinking like this, thinking like that, and I was trying to protect you, but I went this way. I went that way. And sometimes, y'all, we got to throw our pride aside and love them back to life. Hallelujah. You will win your family over when you get rid of your pride. Get rid of your arrogancy, y'all. Get rid of that high-heartedness kind of spirit and say, you know what? I was wrong. I wish I had somebody with me right there. Don't be surprised when the Lord speaks to you to go apologize to that supervisor and start your new year off right at work. We need to start this off right. 
We don't need to be acting like we've been acting down in 2011, 2016, 2019, 21, 22. We need to change. The lepers, very immediate attentions to obey the Lord. Not even gotten to the priest yet. It ushered healing speedily. God wants to usher your deliverance speedily. He wants to usher your breakthrough speedily. He wants to usher your healing in your emotions speedily. He wants to usher your healing from bad memories. He wants to usher inner healing, the inner sanctum of your spirit, inner sanctum of your mind, inner sanctum of your mind and your will and your emotions. You went through some pain some years ago within a year or whatever it was but God wants to deliver you and bring you out of bad memories he wants to bring you out of bad situations you know I know maybe you put yourself in it or maybe you got involved some kind of way inadvertently but the Lord wants to usher your healing spiritually but he says but I want you to do one thing for me I want you to obey me so that I can usher my healing and deliverance to you quickly after we left Here's the question. Are we ready to obey the Lord? I'm getting ready to close now. But are you ready for the Lord to do something for you? Are you ready for him to do something new in your life? Are you ready for him to touch you in a way you ain't expecting him to touch you? How many of you know that after we leave Jesus, we're no longer the same? Hallelujah. Thank God for his blood. Thank God for his deliverance. Thank God for the anointing. Lord, I'm going to have a better year than I've ever had before. Some of you went through some almost dead looking times, but thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy. <laughs> Beloved, as I close, many of you know that after you left Jesus, you feel better. After we leave Jesus, we think better. After we leave Jesus, you think better. After we leave Jesus, we love better. After we leave Jesus, we serve better. After we leave Jesus, we give better. After we leave Jesus, we treat people better. After we leave Jesus, we forgive better. After we leave Jesus, you're seeing better. You understand better. You see now, Lord, I need to treat my neighbor right. After you leave Jesus, you see your neighbor better. You don't view them negatively like you used to, y'all. But after you and I leave, we see our enemy better, y'all. We see their plots and schemes to hurt us and to hurt our children and to hurt your spouse and to hurt your bosses. You see the enemy before he manifests himself. After you leave Jesus, you ain't no longer the same. You praise him better. You see him better. You love better. You have peace of mind. But God wants you to be able to, to walk Walk in him and see him better than you've ever seen him. After you leave Jesus, we're no longer the same.